بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء وسيد المرسلين نبينا وحبيبنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين. Today I am burdened with an enormous task. That task is to explain the virtue of justice and how a just society can be infused with compassion. Justice is not only a societal virtue we demand through slogans like "No justice, no peace." It is also a personal virtue which helps us manage the tyrant within ourselves. No peace, no justice. The other part of the slogan underscores this fact. Al Adil, or the just, is one of God's most beautiful names, and the Quran characterizes the committed followers of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam as a justly balanced or moderate nation, ummah and wasata. The Quran goes on to say, "Verily, God commands that you deliver all trust to their rightful owners, and when you judge between people, that you judge with justice." Multiple lessons may be gleaned from this verse, both explicitly and implied. One implication is that there is an inseparable connection between rights and justice. Another is how rights, justice, freedom, and truth are intertwined, in as much that no right exists where truth does not. No justice can be demanded where no rights are acknowledged, and no truth, right, nor justice exists where the freedom to enjoy the things that make us happy, human, and whole is absent. While God cannot be judged by human moral standards, since He is the Creator and Owner of all, human beings commit an injustice against God with every display of ingratitude. According to the Quran, Surah six, verse eighty-two. Those who believe and do not adorn their faith with injustice, those enjoy safety and are guided aright. When this verse was revealed, the companions of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam complained, "And who among us has not adorned his faith with injustice?" To console them, the Prophet mentioned the counsel of Luqman the Wise to his son, as mentioned in the Quran, Surah thirty-one, verse thirteen: "Dear son, do not ascribe partners to God." For surely ascribing partners to him is a great injustice. By this reference, the companions knew that the injustice being referenced in the former verse actually meant the idolatry and ascription of partners to God stated in the latter verse. Justice among the cardinal virtues may be seen as the capstone of virtues. It completes, fulfills, and unites the goals of practical wisdom, temperance, and courage. Each virtue functions like a balance, regulating extremes in human behavior, which originate from human emotion, thought, appetite, and will. Wisdom regulates folly. Temperance regulates the excesses of human desire, and courage regulates fear. And while each cardinal virtue constitutes a mean or middle point between extremes, the realization of that mean is itself seen as an act of justice. In other words, a courageous person is just in as much that he regulates fear by avoiding both cowardice and foolhardiness. By balancing the excesses of pleasure, temperance becomes almost indistinguishable from justice. And by employing practical wisdom, one avoids the negative consequences of foolish behavior and consequently realizes balance in his decisions. To quote Aristotle, justice is the only virtue that seems to be another person's good, because it is related to another, for it does what benefits another, either the ruler or the fellow member of the community. According to the ancient moral philosopher, to be just is to be law-abiding or fair in one's treatment of others. The Arabic word for justice is al-adl, the same word used for God's holy name, the just. Among its cognates are al-adala and al-maadala. Each word necessitates some form of fair or equal treatment and musawat. Al-adala was the term preferred by the Muslim ethicist Ibn Miskaway, who stated, like his Greek predecessors, that justice is applicable to three places: one, the distribution of wealth and honors; two, voluntary transactions like buying and selling; and three, in matters where oppression and transgression occur. The first form of justice is called justice and distribution, or distributive justice. Its demands are that equal proportions of wealth and honor be given to those who are equal. Equality, however, varies depending upon one's ethical outlook. Is it birth, wealth, virtue, citizenship status, or hard work that makes people equals and others unequal? 
What this means is that when the members of an undeserving class are given rewards equal to those who deserve them, an injustice has been committed. Many will say that this sort of thinking reeks of elitism, classism, and social hierarchy. This is largely because today's radical reformers and social justice activists have declared war on social, class, and even biological distinctions. They believe such distinctions to be the root of all oppressions. As believers, however, we must remember that our primary source of morality and understanding of justice comes from God and scripture. The Quran reinforces and celebrates these distinctions. Social hierarchy and class distinction are constants of human socialization and human nature. Difference is not an evil to be condemned and dismantled. It is something to be celebrated and learned from. The Quran says in Surah 6, verse 165, it is he who has placed you as viceroys of the earth and has exalted some of you in rank above others that he may try you by that which he has given you. And in Surah 43, verse 32, he says, is it they who apportion the Lord's mercy? We have apportioned among them their livelihood in the life of the world and raised some of them above others in rank that some of them may take labor from others. And these are just two examples of the many verses of the Holy Book reinforcing hierarchical norms. The truth is that God has favored certain families, populations, and individual members of those populations. The prophets are better than everyone else. The learned are favored over the unlearned. The strong are favored over the weak. Those who give are better than those who take. And the diligent are favored over those who refuse to work. So when people are rewarded without reference to distinction and effort, if all participants get a trophy, injustice is being done to both individuals and to society. Justice in exchange is the second form of justice mentioned by the ancients. It manifests in providing assurances to the parties of any transaction that the goods being exchanged are of equal value. When those goods are not of the same genus, species, size, and measure, there should be a principle shared between the parties which compensates for the lack of sameness. A cow may not be the same as a goat. However, two or three goats may be an acceptable substitute for one cow. Justice in exchange also entails the inclusion of measures that prevent one party from unduly exploiting the diligence of another. It is not greed to want to keep money that one legally earns, but it is greed to want to usurp wealth earned by another. The third form of justice is sometimes called corrective justice. It is concerned with rectifying harm done to others. A government authority may not be able to restore the life of a loved one taken by a murderer. That government, however, may be able to mete out just punishment for the killer and force him to compensate the family for his crime. In our time, other forms of justice have been posited. They include environmental justice, occupational justice, and social justice. Social justice is the most popular today, even though it combines many incoherent assumptions and promotes flawed and contradictory reasoning in pursuit of the stated goals of social equality. Social justice validates collective guilt and culpability. It stratifies society into oppressors and victims to the extent that one can guess the aggrieved and aggrieving parties on the basis of singular factors like sex, sexual orientation, race, religion, or political party. This makes social justice social injustice in actuality, since it erases the individual and endorses unequal treatment between equals. According to the illustrious Persian scholar Raghab of Asfahan, justice means to assign portions equally. For Raghab, the origins of justice are two. One form is natural, absolute, and judged by the mind to be good. This includes showing goodwill to another, in response to their own generosity shown toward you. Another is protecting someone from your own harm due to their decision not to harm you. The other origin of justice is the revealed law. This latter form of justice, however, may be abrogated, superseded, or suspended in as much that it has at times been viewed as a relativistic transitory justice. An example he offers is the law of reciprocity, an eye for an eye. The Quran in Surah 16, verse 90 says, Verily God commands justice, goodwill, giving to kith and kin, and forbids indecency, wrongdoing, and transgression. Here, I would like to pause for a brief reflection. Notice how this verse states that God commands justice, but also commands goodwill. In Allah, Ya'mur bin Ali Ihsan, according to Muslim exegetes, in this verse, justice means reciprocity. If one is good to you, be good to them. 
and if they are bad to you, show them equal treatment. Goodwill or ihsan, on the other hand, means that if someone does good to you, you should treat them better. And if they show you ill, you should offer a more charitable response. We call this taking the high road, but this is not the only verse that calls believers and others to sacrifice justice for God's pleasure and the good of society. The Quran is actually replete with this call to the moral imperative of pardon and compassion. Perhaps the most detailed demonstration of this principle is found in verses 36 through 43 of the 42nd chapter of the Quran entitled Ashura. They read as follows. Now, whatever you have been given is but a passing comfort for the life of the world. And that which Allah has is better and more lasting for those who believe and put their trust in their Lord. Those who shun the worst of sins and indecencies, and when they are angered, forgive. And those who answer the call of their Lord and establish the prayer, and whose affairs are a matter of counsel, and who spin of what we have bestowed on them. And those who, when great wrong is done to them, defend themselves. The recompense of an offense is an offense of like thereof. But whosoever pardons and makes amends, his reward will come from God. He loves not the wrongdoers. And whoever defends himself after he has suffered wrong, for such there is no way of blame against them. The way of blame is only against those who oppress mankind and wrongfully rebel in the earth. For such there is a painful doom. And verily, whoever is patient and forgives, that verily is of the steadfast heart of things. The right to address injustice is non-negotiable. But notice how in this verse, the encouragement to forgive is mentioned thrice. If someone makes you angry, forgive. If a wrong is done to you, forgive and make amends. It finally praises the one who endures the offense patiently and forgives. The Prophet Muhammad wasallam said, The strong man is not judged by the ability to overpower. The strong man is he who controls himself when angry. One of the great sages of early Muslim history, Al-Fudayl ibn Ayyad said, Whenever a man comes to you complaining of another, say to him, Dear brother, forgive him, for forgiveness is nearer to piety. But if he says, my heart will not allow me to forgive. Rather, I will address the injustice as God has ordered me. Say to him, if you are good at addressing injustice, then address the injustice. Otherwise, return to the door of forgiveness, for it is a wide door. And he who forgives makes amends. His reward will come from God. The forgiving person sleeps well in his bed at night. The one who addresses injustice, on the other hand, turns things upside down. Justice not only turns matters upside down. As many of us know, it can sometimes leave us without friends. In the words of our holy prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, anyone who assumes the position of a judge is slaughtered without a knife. Our scholars say that this is because most people incline towards injustice and seek to satisfy their inner tyrant. So when judges pass verdicts that undermine the selfish interests of the disadvantaged party, the judge becomes hated. We can easily see how this works in today's politically charged world, and it's only those who are blessed with the cardinal virtue of justice who can ensure positive outcomes. According to the great Hanbali scholar Ibn Qayyim al Josia, the Sharia, the revealed law, is God's justice between his people and his mercy between his creation. The coupling of justice with mercy has been the hallmark of Muslim civilization since the beginning. One rarely finds an invocation of justice without reference being made to mercy or amnesty. The merciful Ar-Rahman is one of God's most special names. 113 of the Quran's 114 chapters begin with the name of God, the merciful, the compassionate. For centuries, the very first prophetic tradition taught to Muslim children was the tradition those who show mercy will be shown mercy by the merciful one. Ar-Rahimuna yarhamahum ar-Rahman. And the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu wa sallam quoted God as having said, Verily my mercy has conquered my wrath. In rahmati ghalabat ghadabi. This tradition of mercy and amnesty continued throughout Muslim history. The Prophet Muhammad gave amnesty to most of his pagan enemies during the conquest of Mecca. And in emulation of the Prophet Salahuddin al Ayyubi, the 12th century Sultan of Egypt and Syria gave amnesty to the Franks and remaining crusaders after recapturing control of Jerusalem. 
A favorable mention also is the great Libyan warrior scholar, Sheikh Omar Mukhtar, who resisted the Italian invasion of Libya and was famous for his refusal to kill Italian POWs. He reportedly said to his soldiers when they demanded reciprocity for the killing of Muslim captives by Italians, they are not our teachers. This tradition of amnesty resurfaced again in the recent takeover of the Taliban who offered amnesty to the Afghan army. Regardless of where you fall in the debate about the virtue of a Taliban-led Afghanistan, this attempt to honor the prophetic legacy to assuage fears was clearly observed by those who are familiar with it. Mecca by itself was a grand exhibit of amnesty, and true forgiveness is when one has the power and right to punish, but chooses pardon. The Prophet's chief foe, Abu Sufyan, was told, whoever enters the abode of Abu Sufyan is safe. Man dakhara dara Abu Sufyan fuhu amen. Six people, unfortunately, were marked for death on the day of the Meccan conquest. Ikrimah ibn Abi Jahl was among them. Ikrimah fled to Yemen and boarded a ship which entered stormy waters. At that moment, Ikrimah vowed to God to return to Mecca and pledge allegiance to the Prophet if he spared his life. According to another version of the story, it was Ikrimah's wife, Um Hakim bint al Harith, who petitioned the Prophet to grant Ikrimah amnesty. Despite this factual discrepancy, where there is no disagreement, is that the Prophet وسلم, forgave him, despite him and his father before him being one of the Prophet's vilest enemies. This is just one of the many examples of amnesty reported to have happened on the day of the Meccan conquest. In Medina, where Muslim rule had already been solidified, the spirit of mercy could be seen in other ways. As stated in the beginning, to be just means to be law-abiding and fair. A person who commits sin, especially one that warrants worldly punishment, is unjust in that he or she violates the law. An authority figure is just to the extent that he is fair in his treatment of those over which he rules and whose disputes he is expected to resolve. Medina was a place where all the Arab and Jewish tribes entered into a pact of mutual protection and service under the leadership of the Prophet Muhammad wasallam. Consequently, when disputes developed, the Jews would often refer the matter of judgment to the Prophet. He would judge in favor of Jews when they proved to be the aggrieved parties. And while he did punish for crimes, he was chivalrous, discouraged confessions, and encouraged the concealment of private offenses. To demonstrate this, he punished a man known as Ma'iz ibn Malik for adultery, after encouraging him multiple times to simply seek God's forgiveness and not repeat the act. But Ma'iz insisted upon being purified. On another occasion, a woman confessed of committing adultery as well, and demanded that the Prophet purify her like Ma'iz was. When the Prophet attempted to dissuade her from confessing, she responded that, it seems that you want to dissuade me as you tried with Ma'iz. I am pregnant. Upon hearing this, the Prophet وسلم, directed her to complete the term of her pregnancy. After giving birth, the woman returned stating her readiness to be purged of her sin. But the Prophet told her to go nurse her baby for two years until it was weaned off her milk. Once the baby was weaned, she returned once again this time holding the baby with bread in hand, proving that it was no longer dependent on her milk. It was only at this moment that the Prophet ﷺ meted out her punishment. He then said she had repented in such a way that if it had been divided among 70 people of Medina, it would be enough for them all. This woman had ample opportunity to flee the city and to relocate with another tribe that did not punish for crimes like her own. And if she had never returned to the Prophet, he would have never taken her to task for her confessions. It was only because he gleaned the signs of true sincerity in her that led him to act and grant her wish. In spite of her sin, he said of her after praying over her, have you ever seen a greater repentance than she who gave her life so graciously for God's sake? What this shows is that the Prophet ﷺ was not obsessed with punitive justice. He was sent as a mercy, not an overlord. He understood that our salvation has more to do with what we do willfully and sincerely for God's sake than out of fear of pain or execution in this life. He saw all human beings as redeemable and sinners as nothing more than victims of Satan and human frailty. His ultimate goal was for everyone to gain entrance into heaven and be spared from the torments of hell. To reflect God's qualities, he chose mercy over wrath, forgiveness over justice, 
Justice is an important right due to anyone who has been wronged, but to be just takes enormous effort and significant spiritual exertion. Although justice unites and forms the ultimate realization of the virtues of wisdom, temperance, and courage, without wisdom, temperance, and courage, no person can attain this great virtue of justice. If our overriding concern in life is for achieving justice from another, but little effort is made to be just ourselves, the goal of creating a just society becomes forever unachievable. And that is largely due to the fact that an insufficient number of us understand the value of forgiveness and its liberating effects on the human soul. The prayer mentioned during the concluding verses of the second chapter of the Quran says, pardon us, forgive us, and show us mercy. So let us all learn how to pardon, forgive, and show mercy if we truly hope for those things from God. وَمَا أُوْتِيْتُمْ مِنْ شَيْءٍ فَمَتَاعُ الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا وَمَا عِنْدَ اللَّهِ خَيْرٌ وَأَبْقَى لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَلَى رَبِّهِمْ يَتَوَكَّلُونَ Now whatever you have been given is but a passing comfort for the life of the world. And that which Allah has is better and more lasting for those who believe and put their trust in their Lord. This is Dr. Abdullah Ali, faculty member at Zaytuna College. I hope you liked today's program and would consider joining the 12,000 Strong Initiative to support the college today. This program was possible because of your generous efforts. To support the college, please click the link in the description box given below and subscribe to Zaytuna's YouTube channel. Jazakallahu khairan. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.